parks, you can't really have a city without them. So today we're gonna to talk about what makes for a great city park, why they're important, and where to find the truly great ones. The top 10 urban parks or urbanist parks, if you must, in North America are coming your way. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Well, transportation is pretty tangential this week, but I do like to mix it up on this channel. And I've had a ton of requests for videos about urban parks, but this comment is pretty representative and it kind of gets at the direction I wanted to go with this. Making a top 10 urban parks would be very interesting, judging by accessibility, integration, usage, etc. It's not all about size. So this isn't gonna be a best parks list like you might find if you put it in a Google search bar. Because as always on this channel, this is gonna be the best in terms of the things I feel are important, which we'll talk about when I get to the criteria. In a nutshell though, these are gonna be urbanist parks. Parks that have a positive relationship with surrounding density and have good multimodal connections. But, well, yeah, they still have to be great parks on their own merits, too. So to even be considered, these have to be urban parks. Parks where you have to drive or take transit to a far-flung suburb are not what I'm talking about. But also, what I'm looking for, and maybe this is just me, I like a bucolic expanse in the middle of the city, so for that, size does matter. I'm not looking for small, over-architected, yeah, I just invented a word. Overprogrammed parks that feel crowded. I mean, those are fine, but they're a different definition of urbanist. I'm thinking of Clyde Warren Park in Dallas or Bryant Park in New York, which I do like both of those, but I think of those more as plazas or tightly controlled public places than as actual parks. I do want to spend a bit of time on the criteria. So as I talk through this, I'll try to illustrate with one of my all-time favorite urban parks worldwide. And yeah, that could be a list too. But it's Retiro Park in central Madrid. So first, centrality. And by this, I don't just mean it's for central city dwellers. Centrality means it's accessible to all the people who live, work, or play in the center of the city, which is usually everyone, at least from time to time. Second, transit access and connectivity, and for this I'm really looking at rail. All these parks will have bus service, but I really want parks that have high capacity service. The more stops and more different lines available, the better. Next, urban integration. It matters if the park has a symbiotic relationship with surrounding neighborhoods, and in the best cases, really easy access to businesses that are across the street where you can grab a picnic lunch or a beverage after a long walk. Attractions, I do like a park that has a variety of things like museums, zoos, cultural centers, gardens, things that draw in a broad range of users with diverse interests access to water and by that i don't mean an actual beach although that can be good i'm thinking more along the lines of ponds lagoons places that are conducive to just being contemplative and if there's boating or swimming i'm all for that too play fields i'm pro play fields i know these are things you can access at smaller neighborhood parks but i find having like kid baseball and adult co-rec sports in an important central space just feels democratic to me. Trails, this one's big for me. I like a variety of walking paths that I can switch up every time I go. This really goes back to the size question somewhat and what I really think is important in parks and that is can you get lost in nature or at least a reasonable simulacrum of nature. And finally, kind of a negative one, which is, does it have golf courses? Because I'm taking away points for that. Parks should be democratic places, no user fees, unless you're going to like a museum or renting a boat or something. It's public space, and golf is not a worthy urban land use, especially not in a public park. Because really, a golf course is a huge, single-purpose chunk of acreage that's basically useless for poor people, and for the disabled, and for people who just don't care about golf. Just one YouTuber's opinion. And rant. That was way too much preamble, but I just love the Retiro. 
Anyway, I'll just get into it. Number 10 is Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. You're gonna see as we go through that these are mostly big, well-known, almost touristy parks. If you live in one of the cities I'm talking about today, I'm sure you have a favorite park you may like better than whatever the one is that's on this list. Like for San Francisco, maybe Mission Dolores or Buena Vista. So go ahead and tell me all about it down in the comments. For Golden Gate, it really does have just about everything. Museums, play fields, space you can get lost in, and even some beach access. The transit isn't gonna be as good as some on this list, but I did give credit for the end Judah line. Number nine is Fundadora Park in Monterrey, Nuevo Leon, Mexico. This one is interesting. The grounds aren't huge, but it's built on the site of a decommissioned steel foundry. So it's like a mega version of something like Gasworks Park in Seattle. The park doesn't have a huge amount of open space, but lots of museums and attractions. It's got a river walk. It's got metro stations at each end of the park. The Line 1 Griga station on the east end and the Line 3 Santa Lucia station on the west end. Number eight is Stanley Park in Vancouver, BC. This one doesn't have nearby rail access at all, but it shares the peninsula with downtown, so it really is very accessible to a lot of users. And it's definitely big enough to where you can get lost in it away from the city. The big thing here is that it's almost completely surrounded by water. You've got the Burrard Inlet on one side and Vancouver Harbor on the other, and the seawall path goes all the way around with absolutely incredible views. Another thing I really love to see is good nearby housing density. Residential high rises along the edge of the park. I mean, this is central Vancouver, so there are gonna be residential high rises basically everywhere. And speaking of residential high rises along the edge of a park, number seven is Forest Park in St. Louis, Missouri. This is another example of St. Louis being a city that just lives a lot bigger than what its actual population is. My theory is this goes back to a time when it was one of the five biggest cities in the US. So the neighborhoods and infrastructure seem to have been planned and designed as if it was gonna to continue to be one of the five biggest cities in the US. The park has lots of cultural attractions, but lots of very bucolic open space too. And it's very accessible to the city's relatively young light rail system with stops at the west, the north, and the east ends of the park. Forest Park could have been even higher on this list if there wasn't so much golf. It's like you can literally be wandering through and then you find there are huge swaths of the park that are completely impassable if you didn't pay a greens fee. It's really not good. Number six is Prospect Park in Brooklyn. There's no golf in Prospect Park, but there is a killer museum and a really well-balanced, well-arranged collection of lawns, gardens, lakes and ponds, and woodsy areas. This is one of the Olmsted design parks, so you'd probably expect nothing less. It interfaces beautifully with the surrounding neighborhoods, and you've got subway access all the way around the entire perimeter with access to six different lines. It's actually hard to imagine I have five parks ahead of this one, but I do, and number five is Balboa Park in San Diego. This is probably the number one park on this list in terms of sheer number of different attractions. Obviously, the San Diego Zoo, which is world-class, but you've also got a bunch of museums, including the Comic-Con Museum, apparently. Also, an organ pavilion, a puppet theater, a globe theater replica, a model train museum. I mean, it just never ends. Really good proximity to downtown and decent access to the light rail network. Although you have to find your way past this incredibly large freeway interchange. So here's my hesitation. Balboa Park almost feels too touristy to be on this list. Like there's almost too much going on here for it to be a place you can just go enjoy nature and solitude. So if you live in San Diego or have lived there, let me know. If you're a local, do you really spend much time in Balboa Park? Number four is Fairmount Park in Philadelphia, just north of downtown and spanning both sides of the Schuylkill River. Okay, full disclosure, in researching this video, I spent a lot of time Googling best urban parks in the US or Canada or Mexico or really the world. And this one just does not show up on very many lists and I don't quite understand it. It really does have everything. Tons of attractions, 
museums, gardens, theaters, a zoo, good water access with boat houses, trails, plenty of athletic fields, no golf, good transit access. I mean, you can basically walk to the park from the 30th Street Station. So when I tell you Philly is an undervalued city, this is what I'm talking about. Okay, if you're a parks nerd and you have a good feel for the criteria so far, you probably know what the top three are already. But before we get there, quick reminder to drop a like on the video unless you're some sort of monster who doesn't like parks. Subscribe and hit the bell to get notified when I upload every week. Check out my Patreon down in the description if you'd like to support the channel more directly and access additional content and conversation. Sub count check. The channel now has enough subscribers to fill T-Mobile Park, home of the Seattle Mariners, who have still managed to not ever play in a World Series or even sniff Game 7 of the ALCS. It's all actually pretty pathetic if you think about it, but you can't choose the teams you love. I covered T-Mobile in my Urbanist Ballparks video, but I'll add this little tidbit. Probably the only ballpark that has a regional and passenger rail line, a light rail line, and an enormous bus base right behind the stadium. Honorable mentions, I did expect Griffith Park in LA to make this list. There's a lot to like, but when I really looked at it, it was too much golf, too disconnected from the city, too little transit access. But if you own a car, which you probably do if you're in LA, it's probably great. Boston Common is lovely, but just too small. I need something I can get lost in. High Park in Toronto, close but no cigar. And I have a special soft spot for Washington Park in Portland, which has a lot of the elements I look for, including, in a way, the best transit access you can possibly have, which is a station right in the middle of the busiest part of the park, with elevators going 259 feet down to what's purportedly the deepest station in the US. Smartest transit investment of all time? Maybe not. But man, it's fun to bring your bike on the train and then just bomb downhill all the way home. I don't really have dishonorable mentions here, just cities that make me scratch my head a little. DC, the National Mall just doesn't fit my definition of a park and there really just isn't a standout otherwise. And the Twin Cities, which has one of the best park systems in the US, but again, no standout. Okay, let's move to number three, which is Chapultepec Park in Mexico City. This one truly is world class. It's got incredible cultural attractions, including the National Anthropology Museum, which is a can't miss. It's got a castle that dates from 1785. It's got a zoo. It's got a lake you can boat on. It has miles of paths and trails running through lush vegetation. It interfaces beautifully with the surrounding neighborhoods, Polanco to the north and Condesa and Roma Norte to the east. And it has excellent access to the city's great metro system, with two Line 7 stops on the west side and Line 1's Chapultepec station on the east side. Number two, Grant Park in Chicago, but for this I'm actually including Millennium Park and Maggie Daly Park. They're all contiguous. Incredible cultural attractions, great access to the lakefront, and I love that it's the clear-cut place you're going to celebrate when a Chicago team wins a championship. The proximity to downtown and all the dense transit is maybe better than anything on this list. My only hesitation is, yeah, it's big, but can you really get lost in it and feel like you're in some kind of meadow or something apart from the city? Maybe not, but there are lots of great places to linger. Also, honorable mention to Chicago's Lincoln Park, which is great in its own way and has just about everything that Grant Park might lack. So yeah, if you're in Chicago, you really do have the best of all worlds. And number one is, of course, Central Park. I don't know if this is even debatable, but feel free to make your arguments down in the comments. It is a place that feels like it should be overrated, but it just isn't. I mean, it functions at every level. Lots of cultural attractions, including, for my money, the best art museum in the Western Hemisphere. A castle, not as old as Chapultepec, but still great. An incredible mix of lovely wooded areas and glorious open lawns, lakes, 
reservoirs and ponds for boating or just hanging out and contemplating the meaning of life. Ball fields galore, swimming and ice skating in season. Extremely cool design features, including the bridges, of course, but also the old Manhattan schist outcroppings that are all over the park. Seamless interfaces with diverse neighborhoods on every side of the park with no freeways obstructing your path. Subway stops around the perimeter of the entire park, serving like 14 different lines. It is the best you can do in North America for my money. And that's all I've got. Thanks for enduring and special thanks to the patrons who keep me busy making new end screens for the videos every week. It does mean a lot. Keep the great topic suggestions coming and I'll be back with a new episode next week and I'll see you then.